Hello and welcome. Today we will talk about the analysis and design of work that you and I are involved with or that you might be involved with in your workplace or as a consultant in somebody else's workplace. The analysis of work in job analysis is very important because it determines who should do the job, what kind of qualifications he or she should have. So we need to collect job analysis data in order to make improvements, in order to have a proper job design. So designing jobs to enhance motivation, attitude, well-being, and performance of all workers. If you have a good job design, it also allows for flexible work arrangements for your employees. So why do a job analysis, because we need to translate strategic goals into specific work processes. That's why we do job analysis. Job analysis is an essential HR function that forms the basis for all other human source functions. There are many terminologies involved in job analysis. Let's look at some of them. So tasks are those elements of a job analysis that are typically used to describe the job itself. Knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics or KSAOs are attributes workers need to carry out their work effectively. SMEs or subject matter experts or people who provide uh, good information about the job. They provide the know-how, they provide how sh things should be done because they have been doing it or have done it for many weeks or years. Competency modeling is a type of job analysis to understand what types of attributes and behaviors are required for a group of jobs. There's a difference between job and position. So job is a group of related duties within an organization. Position, on the other hand, are duties that can be carried out by one person. So position versus job. There's also differences between job description and job specification. Job descriptions are shorter documents than a full job analysis. They provide the title and purpose of the job, as well as a general overview of the essential tasks and duties and responsibilities. On the other hand, job specifications focus on the characteristics of an employee who actually does the job. So we need to see the big picture. This is where workflow analysis comes in, which allows companies to adjust to changes at any given time. Workflow analysis provides guidance for making jobs more motivating to workers as opposed to them repetitively doing the same thing over and over again without having the energy or motivation to continue doing it. Workflow analysis requires usage of more sophisticated analytics techniques. So this is why it's so important to at least begin collecting data and use measurements and analytics and everything we do. So how do you collect job analysis data? Well, we can interview people. We can survey SMEs or subject matter experts, which happens to be a common method of uh, job analysis. And we can conduct interviews individually with subject matter experts, or we can do it in small groups. We can also observe people doing the work to see what steps are involved and how fast they're able to get it done. And then study that over and over again, sort of like the scientific management studies that was done by Frederick Taylor over a hundred years ago. There are some logistical issues in job analysis. So when choosing subject matter expert samples, make sure that the sample is a good representative of the population you're studying in the job for which you are collecting data. Prepare the subject matter experts for job analysis by letting them know why you're reaching out to them. In the task KSAO analysis, you develop an initial list of tasks in KSAOs 
you develop an initial list of tasks and knowledge and skills and abilities and other characteristics that are required. You document the criticality of tasks in KSAOs. You demonstrate that KSAOs are linked to critical tasks. You can use the critical incidence technique for job analysis. You can ask the subject matter experts to describe frequently encounter critical job situations that they face every single day, every single week, or periodically. You can ask subject matter experts to generate examples of both good and poor responses to customers' demands or to any demand during these critical events. For example, a customer asks you to make his or her food a special way, but unfortunately you don't have the ability to make it the way the customer wants it. So what would be a good way of responding to the customer given these facts? There's going to be good responses and sometimes there's going to be poor responses. You can't just say that, oh, we don't make that. You have to order from the menu. Well, that is the reality, but the, the way you respond to the customer makes a difference in terms of whether he or she stays there, eats your food, or goes someplace else. So good responses and perhaps not so good responses should be discussed. And the goal would be here to retain the customer or please the customer during these critical moments. We also need to understand competency modeling which is a type of job analysis to understand what types of attributes or behaviors are required for a group of jobs. Competency modeling is more comprehensive, um, shows similarity and differences across jobs, can also cross levels. They allow organizations to capture their goals and values. And when it comes to describing competency models and how they differ from job analysis, Experts have said that executives typically pay more attention to competency modeling than to job analysis. Competency modeling often attempts to distinguish top performers from average performers. Competency models include descriptions of how the competencies change or progress with employee level. Competency models are usually directly linked to business objectives and strategies. Competency models are developed top down, starting with the top level managers rather than bottom up or starting with the employees. Competency models do consider future job requirements either directly or indirectly. Competency models are frequently used actively to align the HR systems. And also competency models are usually or often in organizational development intervention, which seeks broad organizational change as opposed to a simple data collection effort. So competency models are critical for our analysis and success in the organization. Once we have done a good job of our job analysis in determine what competencies are necessary for a specific job, we can try to design the job with motivation considerations. You can enlarge the job, you can enrich the job, you can even have job rotation. So job enlargement is addition of more activities and responsibilities to a job so that it is less boring and more motivating to workers. Job enrichment allows workers to have greater decision-making power or autonomy over what they do every single day. Job rotation is rotating employees from one job to another, making their work less boring and allowing them to learn new skills. So a lot of times corporations have this cross-functional training where employees learn new skills every few weeks, every few months, or once a year by rotating throughout the organization, those individuals are more likely to rise up the ranks in the future because they understand the importance of every task or every job in the organization. The job characteristic model or JCM proposed that enhancing the characteristics of the job can lead to improved psychological states 
which leads to improved individual and organizational outcomes in the organization. In the Hackman and Oldham's job characteristics model, you have certain characteristics like skill variety, identity, significance, autonomy, and feedback, uh, which can actually enhance job characteristics. And so it basically leads to better psychological states like uh, meaningfulness, responsibility, and knowing how we make a difference in our jobs. All of those psychological states usually lead to individual and organizational outcomes like being motivated, having good performance, highly satisfied, lower turnover, and perhaps even mentoring and coaching others by taking pride in what employees actually do. There's also the job demands control model or JDC, which emphasizes that employees experience stress when there are high job demands and very little control over their jobs. So when they don't have autonomy, unfortunately, they may experience more stress on a day-to-day -day or week-to-weeks on our, or on a periodic basis. The job demands control model, uh, when you do have high psychological demand and control in decision at work is high, you tend to have employees who are very active, very engaged in their jobs. This is where learning and motivation to develop new behavioral patterns become the norm. On the other hand, if you have high psychological demand and low control in decision making authority at work, you're likely to experience high strain where the risk for psychological stress and physical distress are high. So instead of having passive workers, the goal is to convert these passive workers into active workers by providing them control and autonomy over their jobs, especially when the psychological demands are high. So I encourage your people to learn and stay motivated, create that type of culture where they are learning, they are being motivated to learn something new, and obviously performance will be high. The job, job demands resource model emphasizes that job demands can be counteracted by characteristics such as job control, participation, and supervisor support. So again, getting people to be an active members of your department or your team and be engaged um, requires autonomy over their job, require their participation in decision making, and re require good psychological support from the managers or leaders in the department. Let us talk about job crafting. Job crafting is redesigning jobs to fit workers' needs and personalities. It can lead to significant improvements in worker morale and performance. Job crafting is associated with being proactive and being engaged in the organization. Of course, there are individual differences, job characteristics and demographics that have to be looked into before job crafting can take place. So when it comes to job crafting, you increase structural and job resources, you increase social job resources, you increase challenging job demands, but you decrease hindering job demands. The work outcomes would be better job attitudes in terms of satisfaction and lower turnover intention. There's occupational well-being where people are engaged with their work. There's less job strain. And also work performance will be better. So besides job crafting or redesigning jobs to fit workers' needs and personalities, you can also offer flex time and telecommuting arrangements so employees can do their job sometimes from home or at the hours that's most convenient for them. In today's gig economy, obviously, we have a lot of contingent workers. These are workers who are hired for a limited uh, fixed uh, period of time, right? So the disadvantages to workers are that they're vulnerable to job insecurity, wage theft. Uh, they tend to have lower pay, higher poverty rates, and decreased access to health insurance. 
And to employers, the disadvantage is that sometimes you can have unclear cost efficiency and you can have labor shortages, especially when you need them the most. However, the advantages are that it provides flexibility for your people. As always, remember to build a reputation for being an objective, analytic, and a rational, professional way. You can do this by analyzing the numbers, by analyzing the data, and by analyzing all of the facts surrounding any situation so you can make evidence-based decisions. Good luck.